and welcome to Intro to Java with an emphasis on AP Computer Science A with Tokyo EdTech. That is me. Our topic today is recursion. Now, the AP usually introduces this unit at the very end. Um, I think it fits here better. Uh, we just completed static methods, and these are basically static methods, so I thought this would be a good place. Now, don't spend too much time worrying about this particular topic. It's only two, maybe three percentage points uh, of the final exam. I think as long as you really know how to like kind of trace uh, these types of, of functions and to you know be able to like work through an example, I think you'll be okay with the multiple choice questions. They don't really appear on the free response questions as far as I know. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we're going to learn. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about what recursion is, uh, and I'll give you like a little non-recursive example to kind of get the idea going. Then same thing in a recursive example. I'll talk something about called the maximum recursion depth and uh, a base case, which is super duper important uh, in here. So by the end of this, you'll understand what all this is. Then we'll do one example uh, of a recursion algorithm, the Fibonacci uh, sequence. And then we'll talk a little bit about printing order and just kind of how things, you know, work, how, how to think about working through the code. Yeah. So let's go ahead and take a look here. So let's start with a non-recursive example. So what, what am I talking about? Well, what is recursion? So a, recursion, a recursive algorithm, a recursive method, is a method that calls itself. So in my mind, I think of it a lot like a loop, but in, how can I say it, in method form. Um, so you know, recursion is used in, for certain types of problems where the overall problem is a, is a subsection of itself. And you'll see that with the Fibonacci sequence, what I mean with that. Let's take a look at a non-recursive example. So I'm going to go ahead and create some static methods here. So I'm going to make a called a method called public static void uh, print one. That's a very exciting method. And this method, go figure, system.out.println, uh, actually literally just prints one. So let me go ahead and copy that and paste it. And so we'll say we'll print one, print two, oops, and we will print three. So it's going to kind of build up to recursion. So hopefully this will kind of make sense. Okay, so we've got three functions, print one, print two, and print three. So let's go ahead and do print one. We'll call them print two and print three. Let's go ahead and compile it. We'll run it. Okay, very exciting. So we've got one, two, and three. So you can see here, we call print one, returns back to the top. We call print two, returns back to the top. Call print three, returns back to the top. Very, very exciting. So how about this? What if we did this? Print one, and then inside print one, we call print two. Then inside print two, we call print three. So now our execution will go from here from line six, it would jump down to 21, 22, 23. We get to 24, we jump down to 27, 28, 29. We get the 30, we jump down to 33, 34, 35. Now, this is interesting. So this is done, we come back to here, there's nothing after it. This is done. We come back to here. This is done. And then we go back to here. That's important for the last part of this as well. Okay. So here what we've done is we've used three separate methods, but each method is calling the next method. Okay. So what we want to do now is the same thing, but with one method. So let's go ahead and do this so space there so I'm gonna make a new method called print num and I'm gonna go ahead and start with one so I gotta go down here and actually create the method so public static void okay this is gonna be called print as I said print num and we're gonna send a number to the method Okay, so then we say system.out.println num. Okay. 
So, so far, basically what we're doing is we're doing this, but a little bit more generically, we're gonna send it a number and it's gonna print that number. So the part that we need to simulate now is this next call. So what we did here is we called a different function, different method, but what we're gonna do here is we're gonna call System dot out dot sorry wrong. We're going to call print num num plus one. Let me explain how that that's how that works. So we get print num one. Okay, we send the one down here. Num equals one. We print num, which is one. Then we call the method again. But this time, num plus one, so that'd be two, and then three, and then four, and then five. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and compile this and run it. Okay, and now there is an error that comes up. And just have to take a word for it. I don't think, yeah, I think it keeps going. Uh, so what has happened is that we have exceeded what's called the maximum recursion depth. So there's a certain amount of memory that's set aside for this to happen. And when we go over, over that, we have exceeded the maximum recursion depth. Now on my computer, I tested it earlier, it's around 19,000 something uh, calls. So uh, just again, it just ran off the screen here so we can't really tell. So we have a problem. The method of the function is not ending. So this is kind of similar to if we did like int i equals zero while, you know, while i is less than, you know, let's say three, and we do, you know, system out print line, I'm getting lazy here, i, okay. This will run forever because we forgot to put i plus plus. It's kind of similar to that, even though the num is changing. So what we need to add here for our recursive function to, to correctly work is what's called a base case. And the base case is what ends, it is the ending condition, okay? Or the condition that will, or in this case, actually keep it going. So what we can do is you're gonna say if num, I can say if num is greater than two, or I could do if num is not, Let's see, well, I have in the book here, I have is not equal to three. So if the number is not equal to three, we keep calling the recursive function. But once it hits three, it should stop. Okay, and you can see that is what happened here. So let me walk you through it. One gets sent to here. Num is now one. We print one. Is, num, is one not equal to three? True. So we call it again. Num plus one is two. We get the num here, which is now two. We print two. Is two not equal to three? True. Num plus one, so now we do three. We print three. Is num not equal to three? False, because num is equal to three. It's a little confusing, it's a negative there. So this call, like num plus one, four, does not happen. So then the recursive function is finished. Now you can't see it, but it's actually going back through, uh, they're called frames, but it's kind of going back through and then it ends. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of an example of that in, in a few minutes, okay? So we need to have some sort of base, we call base case, which is, where it ends the function, where the function or the method has stopped calling itself. Otherwise, it will just keep calling itself until we hit the maximum recursion depth. Okay. So the example I want to use here is the Fibonacci sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence is like 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, I think 5, uh, 8, 13, 21, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So this is zero, this is one. This number is zero plus one. That gives us one. This number is one plus one. This number is one plus two. This number is two plus three. And you can see the pattern here, three plus five, five plus eight, and eight plus 13, etc., etc. It does continue. 
So the Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the previous two numbers. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So what we want to do is we want to call, we want to find the Fibonacci number, I'll call it Fibnum, uh, equals Fibonacci. I'm going to make a, make a method here in a minute. And let's say we want to find the eighth Fibonacci number. So system dot, we'll print that out, system dot out dot print ln Fibonacci. And plus, well, in this case it's eight. Let's go ahead, actually I'll do it the way I had it here. So int num, oops, num equals eight. We'll put num here for a nice output. And quote plus num plus quotes, quote space. Printing's kind of a pain, isn't it? Uh, equals quote plus fib num. All right. Now this is where it gets interesting. So basically we're just creating a method called Fibonacci and it's gonna give us this Fibonacci number. So I'm gonna come down here. Now notice also that it's got to return a value. We gotta be, we gotta be cognizant of that. So public st static int Fibonacci int num. Okay, so here's how it works. So this would be the third Fibonacci number, or sorry, second. So this is the zeroth number, first number, second number. I think I had that calculator right. Uh, where is it? Zero, one, two. Well, we'll find out in a minute. So what happens? The only exception is because zero. There's no numbers over here, and there's no number minus two over here. These two are the, kind of our base cases. So what we would do, we say if, if num oops, equals zero, return zero. And do it else if num equals one, return one. Because we don't have an n minus one, we don't have an n minus two. Okay. Else, this is where it gets interesting. Return Fibonacci num minus two plus Fibonacci num minus one. Okay, so let me kind of try to walk you through that a little bit. So let's compile it and try it first real quick and make sure it's working. Okay, so Fibonacci eight equals 21. So here's 21. So eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, so that's kind of what I expected. So the eighth Fibonacci number is this plus this. But how do I get this? It's this plus this. How do I get eight? It's this plus this. How do I get five? It's three plus two. How do I get three? It's two plus one. So each number, each preceding number is the sum of its, you know, its two predecessors, which is kind of interesting. Okay. So, Let's try and uh, get that right. So now, but when we get to one, zero, one, okay, it's just one. When we get to zero, it's a zero. When we get to here, it's zero plus one. So number minus one, so zero, one, two. So minus two is zero, minus one is one, zero plus one is one. So each of these calls gives us the previous number plus the double previous number. I'm not sure how to say it. Okay. So let's walk through a case where we do the third zero, one, two, three. Okay. So if num is three, okay, it doesn't equal zero, it doesn't equal one. Okay. So we return three minus two plus 
3 minus 1, which is 2. Okay, so 3 minus 2 is 1. So 1 gives us 1. So then this becomes, this evaluates to 1. It's a little hard to do it with typing. Uh, 1 plus Fibonacci uh, 3 minus 1 is 2. Okay. So now we have 1. Now Fibonacci 2, is it 0? No. Is it 1? No. So Fibonacci 2 is Fibonacci 0, that's 2 minus 2, plus Fibonacci 1, which is 2 minus 1. So if we call, f oh sorry, this should be plus, sorry. So Fibonacci 0 gives us 0. 1 plus 0. And Fibonacci 1, 1 gives us returns 1. 1 plus 1 gives us 2. 1 plus 0 plus 1 gives us 2. So if I change this num to 3 up here, our third Fibonacci number is 2, as you just saw. So that's basically how you trace through this type of problem. Very exciting. Again, probably want to go back and watch that a couple times. It's pretty complicated. Um, again, for the AP exam, typically this would be a multiple choice question where you just have to look at the code and figure out what the value is going to be. Um, so if you break it down like I just did and walk through it, uh, I think you'll be able to do that pretty well. And again, hopefully throughout the course, you'll have more opportunities to practice this. And the last part uh, is kind of really, to me, is quite interesting, is the printing order. So let us do our countdown that we did before. Countdown, and I'm gonna do three, but we're gonna do this recursively. Okay, so I'm gonna do public, static. Uh, this is gonna be a void method, void method. Countdown, and int n. So we're counting down, so if n is greater than zero, spacer make it a little bit more readable then we call countdown again countdown n minus one so that wasn't very good formatting so we call the function recursively oops and then we do else so if we hit zero we print out boom system dot Print ln boom, if you remember that from previous units. And then finally down here we do system. Actually, I forgot that I didn't put this at the beginning. So system, that's the important part here. Dot out dot print ln number. Okay, and there we go. Okay, so let's trace this one together. So we're gonna count down from three to make it easy. So start with three. So num is three. Is num zero? Oh, sorry, wrong function. <laughs> is n, so we print three. Is three greater than zero? Yes. So we call countdown n minus one. So we go from here to the next method. So this is now two. We print two, two is greater than zero. One, one, one is greater than zero. Now we've got zero. So we print zero, I think we're gonna see a zero here. Um, and then zero is not greater than zero, we print boom. And then let's see what happens here. Countdown, oh, countdown wrong, naturally. Um, compile, okay. So you can see we had three, two, one, zero, boom. And in the previous example, we didn't have zero. Uh, let's leave it like this. Um, pretty straightforward. I think this is this kind of makes sense probably to most people. Um, now, here's what's interesting. What would happen if I put this at the end? And this is where, and this is something that might come up on the AP exam, uh, especially in a multiple choice type question. 
uh, what, what's the output order going to be. If I compile this, okay, let's run it. Now, if you think the order is going to be 3, 2, 1, 0, boom, you're not correct. It is boom, then 0, then 1, then 2, then 3. Wow, how did that happen? Okay, so let's trace this one together. So n is 3. Is 3 greater than 0? Yes, it is. We call countdown again. Notice there's no printing here. Okay. So we go to the next, it's called a frame. This would be uh, uh, countdown 2. Then we go to countdown 1. Then we get the countdown 0. This is what's interesting. So remember, we did 3, 2, 1, 0. 0 is not greater than 0. We print boom. Then we print n, which in this case would be 0. This method's over. We jump back to the 1. Remember, we called it here. There's no else because we, this is true. It jumps down here, prints the 1. Jumps back to the next, or that would be 2, sorry. Jumps back to the 1. Okay. This ends, comes back down, prints the 1. Boom, comes back and prints the 0. Or sorry. Prince, sorry, I went, the other, I went the wrong way. Zero, one, two, three, my bad. So it prints the zero, then prints the one, prints the two, prints the three. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I will definitely try to do that more graphically when I teach this in person. Uh, but yeah, so the order is reversed because of the way the code flows. I should have a graphic for this, but I don't. Maybe I'll put one in my book uh, later when I have a chance. Anyway, so hopefully, I know it was a little confusing. I do apologize for that last one, but that is basically what you need to know for the most part, for recursion. At least, at least a, a gentle, hopefully a gentle introduction. Okay, so we looked at what recursion is. Uh, we looked at those non-recursive examples to kind of get the idea of how, you know, data flows and how numbers, you know, flow and how we call functions. Then we converted that to a simple recursive example. Uh, showed you the maximum recursion depth and then the, the need for a base case. We looked at our Fibonacci example and how, you know, it's a big problem is a combination of subproblems of the same type. And then we looked at the printing order and how things go in reverse depending on where the print statement is. So you got to think about how the, the function call works, where it is in the, uh, you know, in the call, where you're at in the program at that point. Okay. So hopefully that helped more than it hurt. Uh, good luck with that one.